Right. Okay. I think uh, we'll give it a start. We've got quite a few people joined us. Um, so welcome everybody uh, to another CFCI uh, webinar. Um, my name is Simon Smith. I'm uh, chair of the CFCI. Um, today we have a slightly unusual um, uh, webinar in that we'll have a we'll have a talk first of all, our standard talk, a lunchtime talk, and then we have a, an annual meeting uh, after the talk. So. Uh, today we, we have a talk on doubling nature in Cambridgeshire uh, we're, and we're very lucky to have uh, three uh, fantastic speakers. Um, we have uh, Fiona, Richard and Charles who will be speaking today on, on three topics and we'll have our usual uh, Q&A session um, at the end which I'll be hosting questions from you. So if I could remind you during the presentation um, if you could uh, raise your uh, questions that you have in either the chat uh, box or the Q&A box that would be very useful and I'll place your questions to our speakers. So if we can start proceedings off as I say the meeting today is is today about doubling nature in Cambridgeshire. Um, we have Dame Fiona Reynolds um, who actually uh, was the chair of the Green Alliance um, and in today's capacity is here as an advisor to the Descupta Review on the Economics of Biodiversity, but also um, many of you probably know Fiona, she's Master of Emmanuel College and past Director General of the National Trust. Um, and so um, very pleased to have uh, Fiona here today. And she's gonna give us, um, I think um, the big headline, which is the nature crisis that we have. She's gonna talk about that for uh, to us today. Um, then uh, Richard Astle for, uh, is, is going is to speak to us. Um, Richard is, is chair of Athene Communications. Um, in his past life, he, he worked at the, uh, the Foreign Office and he, and he worked at the Moscow Embassy. Um, but today he's back in Cambridgeshire and uh, he's going to be talking to us in his capacity as chair of Natural Cambridgeshire. And in particular, he's going to tell us about the um, doubling of nature that's planned and, and uh, with a focus on planning policy and how that might be achieved. And then finally, we'll have uh, Charles Crawford. Um, Charles is a director at uh, LDA planners, um, or designers, I should say. He's, he is a master planner and an environmental planner. He's worked on new settlements, uh, urban regeneration and HS2 as well. And um, Charles is here to talk to us today about um, his work at Water Beach East. So, three uh, very interesting uh, talks coming up, about 10 minutes each, which means we'll have some time for, for a lively Q&A at the end. So don't forget, raise your questions in the chat box. Um, so without further ado, uh, Fiona, can I ask you to start off proceedings? Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. It's lovely to be here. Um, so as Simon said, I'm gonna talk about the nature crisis. I'm not gonna talk about Cambridgeshire, but um, be aware that everything I say is entirely relevant to Cambridgeshire. And in fact, Cambridgeshire, as you'll hear, starts off from a pretty low ebb. So we, we need to do something dramatic and radical. Um, and I've just been involved in the publication of the Descupta Review, and that's what kind of his, recharge my batteries in a sense to talk about and to engage in some important action around the, the nature crisis. Because in a way we all know there's a climate crisis, don't we? But actually I think we're only just waking up to the fact that there is a nature crisis. And in many ways that that nature crisis is bigger than the climate crisis because the climate is within nature. We're talking here about the health and the future of the whole planet, nothing less. However, nature has some remarkable capabilities. And one of those capabilities is the capacity to regenerate. And some of us have seen that in our lives that actually, you know, if you take pressure off, nature can recover. And that in a way is one of the most optimistic reasons for thinking uh, about how we can get a grip on the nature crisis. And of course, nature is far from being in an unmodified state ever since the first humans settled and began to farm in the Neolithic era more than 12,000 years ago. We've modified nature, sometimes beyond recognition, but actually nature has learned to be part of us. And many of our most important habitats in the UK certainly are heavily modified, semi-natural habitats, but nevertheless rich and important and possessing extraordinary qualities. Uh, and extraordinary species. But I think it's also very clear, and this, this is something the Descupta Review brings out, 
very, very clearly that uh, around the 1950s, we reached a point where nature's capacity to regenerate was outstripped by human interference and indeed destruction of nature. So that kind of balance, however achieved, began to tip the wrong way. And we've seen since the 1950s across the globe, quite extraordinary damage of a permanent kind to nature. And we've been on this downward trajectory. I mean, the figures which I won't spend time on though are pretty horrific. In this country alone, between the 1950s and the 1980s, we lost 90% um, of our hay meadows, um, more than a third of our upland, heather moorland, uh, our lowland um, marshes were drained. You know, the, the, the loss of hedgerows, the loss of um, features in our landscape has all been charted very clearly. We've seen species decline, species extinction, species decline, and perhaps above all and most poignantly, we've seen a decline in the abundance of species. So what in our childhoods, I hate to say, our son of us being of a certain age at least, you know, we would have had clouds of butterflies around us. We now get excited about seeing one or two. So we've, we've seen the loss of abundance. But I think the irony is that although for more than a decade, we've had policies to recover nature, and that was led very much by the Lawton Report of 2010, which talked about the need for bigger, better, joined up nature conservation. And the Natural Environment White Paper of 2011, which for the first time committed any government to leave nature in a better state than we inherited it. Actually, the decline continues. It's pretty inexorable. We've made no progress at all. And that is what makes it different from climate, where even if the action is not adequate, um, we are beginning to go in the right direction. We are not going in the right direction on nature. So the question is, you know, what can we do about it? It's no longer a question of tweaking. To reverse nature's decline requires a real shift in both action and mindsets and the very structure of the way we organise things. And, you know, government has recognised this, but we are not by any means there yet. So I'm just going to talk about three bundles of activity where we need to change and need to think. Uh, the first big bundle of activity is around uh, farming and rural land uses. Now, I'm not sure either of our other speakers are going to spend much time on this, so I'm just going to focus on, on that for a while. Farming is our biggest land use. It's had the most destructive impact on nature, particularly since the 1950s when we began to subsidise agricultural improvement and intensification. But actually, it also has the most potential for the future, because if you can bring farming and land use into harmony with nature, you can do extraordinary things. Now, there's a big philosophical question, which is particularly relevant to a, a county like Cambridgeshire, which is the sharing sparing debate, which some of you, you will know, some of you may not know those terms, but basically the, the sparing uh, debate says you, you, you focus intensive agriculture in certain places and then you set land aside for nature. A shorthand for that is what we know as rewilding, but actually um, it means that you create spaces for nature and then continue with intensive farming on the rest. The sharing of philosophy, uh, which is personally where I am, I have to say, is where you say no, every patch of land, everything we do has to be joined up and integrated with nature and you, you need to build nature into the way you farm and that you know is is, is a kind of covers much larger areas and uh, you know has, has in my view um, the more sustainable future now there may be an element of both clearly and in practice I'm sure that's what will happen but you know that's worth bearing in mind um, and it's, there are lots of practical questions too. You know, how do you reverse 70 years where all the incentives have been around intensification of production? How do you get the mindset changes, the practical management changes into a different shape? However, again, the government has started to do the right things, has certainly said the right things. The new ELMS scheme for farming, environmental land management schemes, are designed to subsidise um, public goods rather than production. There's a new movement led by farmers for regenerative farming, which is around healthy soils and healthy ecosystems, which is very exciting. And then there are nature recovery networks, which I'm sure you'll hear more about from Richard around uh, joining up of habitats 
um, across the country so that wildlife can move freely um, and join habitats together. And another review I was on last year, the, the Glover Review of Protected Landscapes, National Parks and AONBs, recommended this, these areas, 20% of England, no less, being prime sites for nature recovery. Now, if you've got nature recovery happening in a proactive way on 20% of England, you would start to see a difference. But we need to think big because at the moment we're not achieving anything. So that first bundle uh, is around farming and, land, and rural land uses. The second bundle, which both of our speakers are going to speak more about, but I won't spend more time on, but absolutely crucial, how we change the development model to put nature at the heart of the way we change land use, um, putting nature into our daily lives, both through new developments, um, new, new housing, new, new settlements, new activity, but actually just as importantly into our cities and towns, into our school playgrounds, into all the ways in which we live and operate as human beings. And it seems to me that that kind of reinsertion of nature, so it's not something you go to visit, it's not something out there beyond the horizon. It's absolutely part of everyone's daily lives, you know, gardening, front lawns, back lawns, you know, streetscapes, putting nature back into the way we live and the way we think about nature is absolutely critical. And the third big bundle, which was mainstream territory for the Dasgupta review, is really about how we make nature central to our economic models, the way we think about what success looks like in society, the way we construct um, incentives and subsidies and all the rest of it at a much bigger level. Um, this is absolutely now about bringing nature from the margins into a centre stage of our thinking. Uh, the Descripta Review highlighted an argument which I've long uh, believed, but actually very elegantly argued, the, the, the craziness of having gross domestic product as our measure of economic success, because it only measures incomes and outcomes. It does not have a balance sheet. It does not have a question of whether our fundamental model is sustainable. So we, uh, Descripta recommends the concept of inclusive wealth, which takes account of long-term, short-term, all aspects of human, natural and developed capital. And just to look at the way we think about nature as being central to what we do. Above all though, we argue that everybody has a part to play. We need to love nature, we need to care about it, we need to be inspired by its beauty and by its sense of importance to all our lives, not just something kind of remote and, and distant, but really a human characteristic of loving nature. And COVID, I think, and the opportunity for us all to just stop a bit, notice what's around us, has I think given us a chance to wake up and recognize the significance and importance of nature to all our lives. So I'll leave it there and it's a useful start to the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, Richard, I believe you've got some slides to share. Yep. Yeah, well, good afternoon, everybody. And, and thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, there's such an important audience to be talking to you, I think, and given what Dame Fiona's just said there, um, this, this crisis of biodiversity is one for us all. And um, it, it's one that we all have to be involved in. Uh, and the point I would sort of almost start with is by saying that nature is in crisis and it, it really does matter. I, I fear sometimes that there may be people, not on this call, I'm sure, but think, well, it might be, might be in crisis in the Amazon, might be in crisis in Siberia, but does that have any impact on me? I'm, I'm not a bird watcher. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I don't particularly enjoy countryside. It does matter. I mean, I put it this simply, if the world around you is dying, then be, be very afraid, and, and it is. Uh, there's just no two ways about it. And Dame Fiona has talked about that crisis nationally, and that crisis is writ large in Cambridgeshire. Cambridgeshire is one of the most nature-depleted counties in one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. So it isn't just about President Bolsano ripping up the rainforest. This really is about what's happened over decades of, I guess, uninformed practice. Uh, I don't think there's been any malice involved in this. We have gone down a, a slope of nature degradation and it will impact on our business. I'm a businessman and it's important to stress that. You know, I, I'm a fully you know, uh, fledged uh, capitalist and I make, my, make my money out of the development industry, as do many of you. Uh, but this matters to me. It matters to the future of my business if we don't get this right. 
And actually, it is a pleasure to be talking to this industry because I find many allies in this industry uh, who recognise that we, we, you know, we, we do have to continue to uh, to build and to construct. We have to do that now in the way that Dame Fiona has talked about paradigm shift, not just about putting some crisp box the integral design of a new building. This is actually about how we think nature first. Uh, and that is for the good of nature, but also very much for the good of us. Because as somebody said, and it might have been you, Dame Fiona, and if it wasn't, probably would have been at some stage, you know, we, we must stop seeing ourselves as apart from nature. We are a part of nature. Simple as that. Was that you, Fiona? That was Das Gupta. It was yeah. das Gupta. That was okay. us. That was Fair us. <laughs> um, what I want yeah. to do is bring that down to, to Cambridgeshire. Talk about Cambridgeshire. Um, I am chairman of Natural Cambridgeshire, which is the local nature partnership for Peterborough and Cambridgeshire. And as a partnership, we bring together players across the development world, the landowning world, the nature conservation world, the health sector, the local authorities. In fact, anybody who really shares the passion for nature or the concern for nature, whether that's out of passion or self-interest. Um, and we operate at a strategic level, developing uh, policies uh, for the combined authority and local authorities to take forward that will address the nature crisis. And inherent in that for us, is our big ambition, which is to travel in nature. That's the title, of, I believe that's the title of the webinar today. Uh, our ambition is to see nature doubled across the county and Peterborough. And what we mean by that is to see, in the first instance, it's a proxy measure, but it is a, it's a valid measure, the amount of land that is managed sensitively for nature doubled. From its current 8% of total land, to about 16% of land across the county. Uh, the sort of good news, bad news about that is uh, if we are to, to, to achieve that, we would reach the dizzy heights of national average, it would be that good. Uh, which just tells you perhaps a little bit about how nature in our area has been defeated. Why is that? Well, because a huge part of the, uh, the natural habitat landscape of Cambridge is of course Fenland, um, and that has been uh, for, for, for many very good reasons, and, 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 and its agricultural value remains enormously important, but the natural value of that area has been literally sucked out of the ground. Um, and it's not just in the Fenlands too, but in the wider countryside, the destruction of hedgerows, woodlands, uh, rubbing out of many of our ancient woodlands uh, has, has gone on apace since agricultural policy changed after the Second World War, and, uh, and we saw the massive habitat. So our ambition is the doubling of nature uh, across this area and we want to achieve that by doubling the amount of land that is managed sensitively for nature and that's not nature reserves that could be the way farmers manage their land through wildlife friendly farming, uh, it could be uh, the way uh, local authorities manage their land or businesses manage their land. It will absolutely be, be, be about how developers, developers and the construction industry think and manage land going forward, or that nature is at the heart of that. How are we going to achieve this? How are we going to uh, shift the paradigm? We're looking at it in two key delivery, um, key aspects of delivery. Again, Fiona's touched on this sort of uh, top-down and, and, and bottom-up approach differential. From a top-down basis, uh, the partnership has identified six priority landscapes across Peterborough and Cambridge. Um, and they are, in no particular order, um, the John Clare countryside, which is the countryside west of Peterborough, the Cambridge network, which is nature network, which is the land surrounding the city of Cambridgeshire, the Cambridge West Hundreds, which is the land stretching from Cambridgeshire down to the Bedfordshire border, the two huge river valleys of the Ouse, and the Neen, and then the connected Fens area in the centre. Um, and those are the landscapes that we have identified as priorities for landscape scale nature recovery. And again, uh, Dave Fiona touched on this, the importance of big areas of land rather than small corners of land, the only way we're going to address this crisis. And in each of those areas, we propose and will be working voluntarily with landowners, farmers, 
to prioritize the restoration and the linking up of key habitats across many hectares of land. Um, nature recovery, as, as was, has, has been said, isn't about, you know, trying to, um, you know, uh, put one new hedge in here or there. It is actually about habitat recreation on a very, very large scale. But with the interests of landowners in mind, and the reason why things are changing so dramatically and why this is far more feasible than it been 10 years ago, is because the agricultural subsidy regime is about to shift entirely. And I find in my work that conversations with landowners that would have been pretty redundant even five years ago are now conversations about true partnership about how we can achieve this because landowners will be incentivized to take these projects forward. I find there are some landowners, like, like in any other aspects of, of, of the world, who now see a financial incentive to take this forward. I find other landowners who are most passionate about doing this and feel that they've just been unable to do it for many years because of the way the agricultural regime has been skewed. So we're seeing people come at this uh, from many different angles, but what it does mean is that opportunities really are there to, to landscape scale um, uh, habitat integration forward. And it's interesting to note that the spatial strategy that was published by the OxCam ARC just last week. I don't know whether people have seen that, but if you have a very important document, I'd urge you all to look at it. But it is, it has the environment front, left and centre. And I think I would just perhaps stress this to the audience. To me, this is a, an example of just how this agenda has changed. Three years ago, in my capacity as the chair of Natural Cambridgeshire, we wrote to the ARC complaining about the fact that you know, the environment and nature was, and I paraphrase, you know, uh, mentioned twice in paragraph 26, so, you know, clause C, and that was it. Now, those policy documents that are emerging from the ARC have the environment absolutely in the first paragraph, and they have nature recovery and biodiversity in there too. And that spatial strategy is looking to identify opportunity areas for biodiversity and for, uh, for nature recovery across a, 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 a spatial strategy that will encompass that whole area between Oxfordshire and Cambridge, as you know. So it's already happening. It's starting to move into policy and anybody involved in the development industry will need, I think, to take great, great uh, um, adherence of this and, and, and pay attention to it. But at one level, landscape led, very big picture, big areas of land, and to be fair, pretty expensive stuff. At another level, and the way we want to achieve doubling nature is through community-led project. This is the antithesis of the Lawton principles of bigger, better, better join there. This really is about every village planting 10 trees a year for 10 years, or restoring the village pond, or putting wildflower down the, the side of the churchyard or the sea. Um, if only one village did one of those things, it wouldn't really amount to very much. But if each of the 300 parishes in Cambridge and Peterborough planted 10 trees a year and a 100 metre hedge every year for 10 years, then you start to see how that can actually make a difference. Too. This is the area of work where we've actually made a start. The, the landscape stuff is, is, is long term and takes months and years to come together. But we've launched a pilot project in the area uh, west of Peterborough. We have 16 parishes signed up. And each of those parishes has now got its own nature recovery plan. And if it weren't for the restrictions around COVID, they would be busily getting on almost as we speak, with planting and the recreation. And we're finding, and this is what's very exciting, communities and landowners and tenant farmers coming together around this agenda to do the small stuff. But if you aggregate it, it can make a difference. And I would just actually sort of give a little bit of a plug here. If any of the people listening today would like to get involved in that work, if it's perfect for, for developers, if you're working in a particular area, and you want to engage your community, this is a great way to build those, uh, those links between the communities and, and, and the development. So that's the second of the two aspects. So six landscapes, and, there's sort of, and, and then beneath that, every community doing it fit. I wanted sort of in the, in the time that's left me just to touch though, on how this translates into policy. It's not just that uh, National Cambridge has said we want to double nature. 
That ambition is endorsed by the mayor. He was uh, he actually was the uh, figurehead who launched that ambition. Um, it is in the emerging spatial strategy for combined authority. Um, it's starting to make its way through local planning policies and local plan revisions in all of the districts. Uh, you may have seen that South Cambridgeshire, for instance, published their doubling nature strategy uh, only two weeks ago. And other local authorities are now looking at, um, at how they embed this within their own policies uh, and plans. And they are also looking at how it matches up with the new requirements around biodiversity net gain. Again, I'm sure many people will be uh, on the webinar will be familiar with the fact that the new policy of all developments, most developments needing to achieve at least 10% biodiversity net gain. Natural Cambridge is in the process of developing recommendations to the combined authority on how that actually gets handled. Essentially, what we want to do is create a single strategic approach, a single portal. Um, that all developers can understand if you're working with Cambridge, this is how it works, this is how you pay your money, this is how it gets to first. We'll be using that strategic framework of the six landscape and the community project to ensure that the money gets spent well and wisely uh, and, and that it keeps nails on the head. We, what we don't want is developer A uh, giving some money to farmer B to put you know, a, a, a pond in a corner of the field which was never suited to make sure this actually all adds up. But if it does, it's very much part of the paradigm shift that was described earlier. So I do think it's, you know, I, I'm going to just put my slides up now, actually, if I may, Simon, because they were really just there as a summary of what I wanted to say. Uh, and this is it. And I hope everybody can see that. Can you just put me a thumbs up if you can see that, Simon? Yep, lovely. So very, very simply, we are, we are, as I say, the local nature partnership. Nature matters and it is in crisis. The doubling nature ambition has been endorsed by the combined authority. It's emerging through the Climate Change Commission recommendations, which will be published in Cambridge next month. And it's now into Oxford Cambridgeshire Park policy as well. We have the priority landscapes, we have the community recovery. And this is now um, emerging in policy and will continue to the next step for us is to formalize the biodiversity net gain strategy so that people can understand in a very simple process of how they manage either on site mitigation or off site. Uh, off -site. And the final thing I wanted to say is that we do have a, a developers forum. I might be missing an apostrophe there, so apologize for that. Um, and if anybody in the audience and yourself, Simon, would like to be involved in that, because we are using that forum help develop the emerging ideas around the net gain strategy, then to uh, just um, drop the alarm and uh, I can put you in touch. That's led by our colleagues Urban and Sip, uh, Rebecca Britton and many other uh, developers and, and, uh, who are involved in this agenda. So it is a big agenda. Uh, there's a lot going on. I think it's only going to accelerate over the coming months. It'd be very, very good to have more and more people involved. If you take all that. Thank you very much. Super, Richard. Thank you very much. Talking of developers, I've got some behind me who are making lots of noise at the moment, so uh, I can't hear everything, unfortunately. Um, uh, Charles, uh, over to you now. Do you want to share your screen? Indeed. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. There we go. Hopefully uh, you can see my screen now. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Good. Um, well, uh, after the sort of global and national themes that, that Fiona laid out uh, relating to the biodiversity crisis and uh, Richard um, starting to translate those into strategic initiatives at a, a more local countywide level, um, I was asked to uh, talk about how uh, we can start to respond to these issues um, in relation to a specific development, a specific site that, that many of us might be working on. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, one, albeit a, a very large project, but um, uh, what we find through our work is that similar processes, uh, similar approaches can be scaled down to, to much smaller developments as well. So I'm going to talk about Water Beach Newtown East 
um, which is a project uh, that uh, LDA has worked on for many years with RLW Estates. Um, I, I will say at the outset that I haven't personally uh, been involved in this work, but uh, there are three reasons really why I've chosen to talk about it. Uh, first, that um, uh, being local, uh, I'm sure, uh, and having a high profile, I'm, I'm sure it'll be um, familiar to a greater or lesser degree with, uh, with everyone um, involved in the seminar. Um, secondly, having finally achieved outline planning consent earlier this month, it uh, is, of course, quite topical. Um, and thirdly, because the thinking that uh, we've uh, put into the project uh, and uh, some of which I will show you um, is reflective of the thinking that, that we're bringing to all of our work um, and of um, really a sea change that I've noticed um, in the last two or three years, and, and Richard touched on it. It used to be felt that um, humans' needs could only be met uh, at the expense of uh, nature. Or on the other hand, if you wanted to uh, provide for nature, then you had to compromise um, what you could provide for people. Um, but as I say, within the last two or three years, I think there's been a complete realignment in that thinking. And what we now have is a recognition that people's needs and nature's needs are uh, mutually supportive, they're entirely compatible, um, and that uh, they are mutually reliant as well. We, uh, as Fiona has described, are fundamentally reliant on nature to maintain the planet and to deliver uh, some of the fundamentals of life. Um, and given how human beings have come to dominate the entire planet, um, if nature is to uh, be protected and survive and thrive, it is reliant on actually humans taking action. We've got to collectively as a species move away from our business as usual approach and start to actively thinking about uh, how, how we and nature can coexist and thrive in the future. So um, in relation to uh, Water Beach, um, uh, we've been working on the uh, eastern part of the scheme, uh, uh, which is uh, about the eastern third of that site. Uh, as I said, for RLW Estates, the other half of the new settlement, the, the slightly larger half, is the uh, scheme that has been brought forward by Urban and Civic um, and was consented uh, a year or two ago. Um, as you can see uh, there, uh, our site is, uh, lies between the uh, former airbase and the railway um, and is almost entirely uh, agricultural land, arable land, um, intensively farmed, um, but was historically Fenland. And what has shaped our thinking about uh, master planning the site from the outset is to uh, work with uh, not just the current landscape, but the underlying historic Fen landscape, and to uh, develop a scheme that uh, reflects and expresses the character of that underlying Fenland landscape and draws the nature that would have been associated with it into the very heart of the scheme uh, to people's doorsteps or their street corners, uh, in fact. So you can see on the left there, the uh, um, pattern of the original landscape, the field boundaries, the Fenland drains and ditches. And as you can see in the center, how we've used that pattern to shape the development blocks uh, which we've called steads, uh, reflecting again that uh, traditional rural character. And then to the right, you can see how even within the steads, we've sought to break them down and bring the landscape uh, right into those development parcels. Um, within this very regular, uh, generally orthogonal kind of pattern, there is one quite strikingly irregular feature, uh, which is this a uh, historic droveway running north-south through the site, uh, Bannell Drove, 
uh, which was an old Fenland uh, trackway with ditches either side, which still survives. And as an example of how we're looking to uh, bring nature and bring the landscapes to Peter, people's uh, doorstep, this visual shows uh, how we envisage Vanald Drove being incorporated into the development. So it's about retaining the historic trackway, making use of it uh, for sustainable transport um, and enhancing the uh, waterways to either side and their margins uh, to uh, reflect the uh, historic qualities of the landscape and the ecology uh, that would traditionally have been associated with them. A couple more images um, to, to again demonstrate how uh, we're proposing to bring nature to uh, people's street corner, to their doorstep. Uh, so within the, the stead areas, we bring these greenways in uh, with uh, native plants, the local uh, species of the area, um, and replicating or where they exist in remnant, restoring and enhancing uh, those natural uh, landscape features that used to be there. Another example here to the left, you've got a, a, a more uh, highly managed uh, landscape um, uh, providing amenity uh, space for people. But to the right, as you can see, you've got a, a lake, you've got reed beds, again, that traditional character coming in. So just going Back to the uh, overall view, you can see to the north of the development an extensive area of green space, um, which we propose as new parks, uh, the Fenland parks as we call them. Um, and just to show the relationships here, uh, to the north of the development, north of the uh, old airbase, is Denny Abbey, a very important historic site. Um, and that is surrounded by green space, which is uh, essential to its uh, historic setting. That's respected by both development proposals. Uh, UNC have a northern park separating their development from Denny Abbey. And then uh, these parcels to the east are our Fenland Parks areas, uh, which are divided into uh, two areas of different character, which I'll uh, come to in a minute. Just to give you a sense of the scale of our Fenland parks, uh, they are top left there at 80 hectares. They're actually significantly larger than any other green space um, in the Cambridge area. Uh, you can see a number of the main spaces uh, there for comparison. Uh, this is, uh, provides a sort of a little more detail, a kind of uh, high level master plan uh, for the parks area. So to the west, uh, we've got the area uh, we're calling Denny Fields. Um, it is in a sense a, tradition, a transitional landscape between the very slightly higher ground around the Abbey and the uh, lower level Fenland to the east. Uh, it includes a number of drainage ditches which drain it eastwards down into the Fen. Um, and we see this as um, comprising species rich grazing pasture, uh, small ponds, small blocks of woodland, um, and a wide range of habitats uh, for wildlife of various kinds, mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, uh, and so on. And then the eastern part, Joist Fen, um, reflects a historic fen on landscape, areas of, of permanent water, uh, shallow lakes, channels, extensive reed beds, a lot of edge habitat. Uh, and whereas the uh, western part will be uh, freely accessible to people uh, to enable them to, to maximize the recreational benefit. Uh, we see access being more tightly controlled um, in the uh, Fenland area to uh, really prioritize wildlife and minimize disturbance to it. So to try and uh, just convey a little more the, the kind of character we're looking to create, uh, this and the next slide effectively take you through a, a transition from Denny Abbey here at the uh, west, at the, the left, uh, through Denny Fields where you can see the species rich parsland and uh, other features I talked about, and then into Joyce Fen uh, where you get the, uh, the true Fenland landscape that we're looking to create. Um, so 
the intention behind this is to uh, clearly to benefit nature, to benefit wildlife, to provide significant um, environmental enhancements uh, in association with the development. Um, but with the, the parklands coupled with um, the uh, spaces I've shown you within the scheme as well, uh, we're looking to deliver a, an overall increase in biodiversity across the site. And equally importantly, uh, where, where the intention is that uh, nature and biodiversity will significantly enhance uh, quality of life uh, for people who will be living on the development. And of course, uh, people living within the existing settlement at Water Beach, we will have access to all of this as well. Uh, a view across the uh, Fenland Parks uh, with um, uh, Denny Fields to the left and Joyce Fenn to the right, again, conveys a little bit of the diversity of character within there. Thank you very much. Super, Charles. Thank you very much. Some uh, lovely images there of what's planned. So uh, we've got quite a few people on the um, on the attendees here today. I think we've got over 100 people and there's, there's a quite a few questions for our panellists. Um, I'm going to kick things off by, um, I don't know, perhaps I should be, perhaps I should be a little bit controversial. I'm going to suggest that, um, that in, in the current age of policy that we have which is which is heavily influenced by social media and um and government's images in social media and perhaps even suggestions that um corporations are more powerful than than than, than some governments at least perhaps at a at various levels um how much can we expect um our government uh, perhaps nationally and, and locally to, to really drive these these important issues through. I think we all recognise there's something to address here. Um, but, but, you know, how, how can we, or do we, do the panellists expect it will be driven uh, by government, national government and local government, or, or will this be something that um, we'll have to get on ourselves and do? So Fiona, if you want to answer that one first, please, and then perhaps if Richard or Charles want to add to that. Well, there's no choice, actually. Government's got to do it, local government's got to do it, and we've got to do it as citizens. Um, I mean, one of the problems that we're in the mess we're in is because of the way government policies operated, particularly in the post-war period. And, um, you know, government's turning that around, actually. It's, it's said it's going to turn it around, particularly on farming policy, but also, you know, the net gain biodiversity on, on the development is, is government policy. And without that, I'm not sure we'd be seeing any progress. So I, it, it's not a choice. It's got to happen at every level. My, my worry, as I've said, is it's not happening boldly enough and fast enough. Um, and, and that's a, a big challenge. Everyone keeps saying this next decade is the crucial one and we've got to take action. Um, and, you know, we've heard a lot about what can be done, but it's got, to, it's got to be a mixture of regulation and incentive to do the right thing. Absolutely. I mean, we have the building regulations for, uh, uh, for, for climate change in terms of, you know, carbon reduction, but goodness knows that's taken many years to see very tiny steps um, and, and we've got to accelerate that. Um, Richard or Charles, do you have anything to add to, to, to governance? A little bit, yeah. I, I think if, if this were all down to government, I'd be, uh, I'd be much more worried than I am. Um, I think what inspires me, actually, is to see some of the, the, some of the, the things that are being done by, by private companies, private landowners. Um, it's, very, it's very interesting to see that many of our largest companies put uh, climate change and environmental crisis number one on their risk register when they're looking at corporate. And to see actually what, what is happening with, uh, with some of the big landowners in our area as well. They, they are moving very fast in, in the right direction here. Uh, and many of them because they recognize they have to do it, not because they're being told to do it or because the government is forcing it. So I actually think that the lead here is actually probably going to come from private landowners and, uh, and quite, a, quite a number of developers are already really taking forward some very exciting schemes. Um, around rescuing. Um, so my real hope lies there that the public will and that being translated into policies of the private sector 
and actually push the government further and further down the path. Um, so I, I'm, I, I am cautiously optimistic that, that combination will work. Super, Richard, thank you very much. Um, Charles, um, perhaps a similar question though, um, but related in that, I guess the question here is, is our, our, most of our attendees probably are construction professionals work on uh, building projects. Um, how, how, do we, how do we measure, what's the word? No, how, how do we actually respond to this challenge and, and how do we measure uh, what we're doing so out at Water Beach, for example, we've seen lots of fantastic images uh, that your, that, that, that your um, company has um, designed. But how do we actually measure that that's going to give us uh, an increased biodiversity or a doubling of nature? How, how, is there a metric that, that, we can, that we can actually, rather than the greenwash that we've had in the past on, on, um, from, from, from some corporates, I should, I, you know, how do we how do we actually give definitive numbers to this to, to what you're doing here? Sure. Uh, well, actually, there is a metric um, emerging uh, in the context of the introduction of biodiversity net gain, uh, which is in the Environment Bill, which is currently progressing frustratingly slowly through Parliament, but um, is expected to reach the end of that process. Um, in I believe about a year or so uh, and will then be introduced. So uh, that will then make it mandatory for all development to deliver uh, at least a 10% overall gain in the biodiversity value of the site. Um, and with that, or obviously has to be a, a means to measure that um, and to test it. Uh, so there have been, um, uh, should we say experimental models experimental metrics over quite a number of years now um, from which quite a lot has been learned. Uh, so it's settling, uh, Natural England is leading the exercise and their metric um, is, uh, is already achieving widespread acceptance, uh, particularly in the ecology industry. Um, most of what were felt to be issues with it because it's a very complex thing and there were issues, uh, but most of those have been ironed out. So uh, once uh, biodiversity net gain becomes in and becomes mandatory, which won't be for another couple of years, but when it does, there will then be an accepted metric for measuring it. Um, now, in advance of it becoming mandatory, there are quite a lot of projects out there which uh, are voluntarily committing to uh, either a net gain or in some cases like phase one of HS2 is committed to no net loss, which still means you have to have a way of measuring it before and after. So um, the, that metric is, is already being used in fact uh, uh, for real uh, in making the calculations on projects like those. Super, thank you, Charles. Um, my goodness, uh, this is really a hot topic. We have got tens of questions coming through. I mean, how diverse this is in terms of a subject. Some people um, referring to um, litter, some people referring to shooting, you know, some people um, referring to uh, the future in terms of how areas are going to be managed and pay for, you know, in the future. This is really a big subject. <laughs> and, and, I think, and I think it's gonna be difficult to cover all these questions in time. Um, the really, another hot one here is, um, in terms of related to Cambridgeshire, you know, we have Camborne, Alconbury Weald, Northstow, Witterington, Water Beach, Bourne, you know, more tarmac, more concrete, um, surely means less to biodiversity. Um, what can we do about addressing population growth, perhaps in terms of population distribution density? You know, would it be better to concentrate perhaps, you know, new developments in, in urban brownfield sites rather than putting them in new settlements? Um, what's the thought on that, Fiona? That's a really thorny subject. Um, I don't want to get too political here, but what do you have any views on that? Yeah, I would. I mean, lots of the conservation movement have rather ignored population growth over the decades, but actually the Descriptor report, we've faced up to it in a very straightforward way. I mean, there's two issues. One is about actual population growth, and there's very clear evidence that education of women is the single best way of reducing family size. That's happened all over the world. I mean, it's happening in some countries like Japan dramatically, 
Now, in this country, um, our main population growth is actually net in migration rather than population growth through uh, procreation. Um, and the other thing that's happening here, which is kind of more significant, I think, is our demands for space and our demands for, you know, different living standards. Um, and so single person households are another reason for the growth in housing demand. It's not actually just about at net numbers of people it's it's about how we want to live our lives and actually co the covid thing has probably made that more challenging because more people want more space and to be living in the country rather than in towns which is why i emphasized quality of life and nature in in towns and cities just as much as in the countryside so you know I, I, the other message of Desgupta is not just about population growth it's about our consumption patterns and can we learn to be happy with less and to use shared green space rather than having private green space and to live in a way that respects nature more profoundly, including things like travel, um, you know, which isn't just a climate issue. Um, it's a nature issue, more roads, more concrete being poured. So, you know, these are not easy issues at all. But I think for me, it's back to that point about we've got to make nature absolutely central to all our decisions and to um, you know, not only address the specific changes, for example, in development or agriculture, but the way we bring, think about quality of life in, in, in sense of how you know, everybody can get access to nature without having to necessarily own a garden or to be you know, privately well off enough to, to, to buy it. And that seems to me at the core of a lot of what we're talking about now. Richard, um, what, what's your views on this in terms of uh, population growth and development? Or I think it's absolutely uh, way past time that people recognise this fundamental population. And, and I, I think it was David Attenborough who said that there's no environmental problem that isn't mitigated by, uh, by lower population. You know, you, the more people there are, the more pressure you find. It's just a fact. And it's very sensitive because you're talking about real people with real lives. <laughs> And you've got to be very careful how you phrase that. But it is a fact that the bigger the population, the more pressure you will put on the environment. And I think it goes back to this shift, and the shift has to be philosophical as well. We have looked, you know, in the 19th century, you viewed uh, everything was about the size of your army and a growing population was a great sort of thing, all about how big you could be. And, and I think GDP has been such a, a, a mistake for us to see the world through GDP. When, when did we decide that life was all about economics? It's actually all about quality. It has to be. And, and so I think GDP gives us such a false representation. And, and that is, you know, it's, it's, it's gross domestic product tied to population. So the bigger the population, the bigger the GDP. And that's not the race that we should be involved in. The race we're involved in should be about how we improve quality of life for everybody. So moving off topic a little bit. But I think seeing population growth as sort of a panacea. Is, 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 the, is, is the past. We need to see how we manage population carefully uh, and, and look to, you know, um, uh, I think it would have to be, you know, the world population will need to be lower to, to become truly sustainable going forward. I mean, it's, these are just facts. And I know they may be difficult to express. But that's certainly where I stand. Super, Richard, thank you very much. Um, Charles, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put another question to you and then I'm gonna come back with a question, Fiona. Charles, there's um, there's a there's a quite a practical question here about well, on typical uh, building projects development, what are the options available at the moment for biodiversity increase? Quite a quite a, uh, a nuts and bolts question, perhaps. But what you know, are we talking green roofs? Are we talking um, tree planting? I mean, tree planting is not possible on every on every development site. What, what are we what are we talking about? Swales, ponds? Is is there a is there a, a toolkit? Um, well, I guess kind of all of those. Um, the, um, the important thing to start with, of course, is, is understanding what the nature of the existing ecology is on any particular site, because every site is different. Um, if you try and take a generic approach to what provision you make for nature, um, it, the success will vary from one site to another because you'll have different species that are um, able or not able to take advantage of the opportunities you provide. So, so it does start from having uh, ecologists undertake uh, surveys to establish what's there, what's in the vicinity, but also more creatively to go beyond 
that uh, uh, sort of um, process of simply counting them and then assessing what the impacts are and mitigating for them to actually thinking creatively about given the particular site and its particular context, what are the opportunities here for nature? Um, but yes, I mean, there, there's a range from um, provision on or within buildings, such as inherent bird boxes, bat boxes, green roofs, etc., to uh, things as simple as street trees. Um, and then uh, you perhaps need to think about what species you're going to plant because uh, some some uh, tree species vary enormously in terms of their capacity to support biodiversity. Um, sustainable drainage swales, as you mentioned, Simon, um, and also actually areas of open space, whether that's publicly accessible open space, or as I described, sometimes you limit public access to, to maximize the benefits for biodiversity. So I think it's very, it's very, very difficult to generalize. There, there are a huge number of options out there um, and you've got to understand your site um, and respond creatively um, in the way that is best going to benefit your site and the nature on it. Super. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, we really are uh, now only two minutes left and, and we must have about 20 other questions that you want to place to our panellists. Perhaps we need to rerun this, um, but it just shows you the level um, of interest and, and, and action I think that's needed. I mean, I, I read the recent New Scientist um, February, they did a, a feature on rescuing uh, biodiversity and, and it was quite it was quite phenomenal. Some of the, um, the One Planet Summit um, uh, quotes that were coming out uh, you know, saying that the the amount of uh, human uh, mass that we've created from all the materials now outweighs the biodiversity mass. I mean, I'm an engineer. Those sort of things uh, stagger me that we we are now pr more productive um, than our planet in terms of of, of mass. Uh, um, but anyway, it, it just shows you. There's one final question I think I should perhaps um, place, and that's to Fiona: Is our government going to respond to the descriptor? Um, review or not. Fiona, do you want to uh, respond on that? Yes, it is. It said it's going to. Um, so, I mean, I think we have to hang on to that. The, the, the one great advantage the Descriptor Review has is timing in that it's come out um, just before not only the climate COP, which we all know about, but there's a nature COP in May, which is exactly the same international process of looking at nature recovery and uh, if the government uh, responds before then which it's said it will then we stand a chance of seeing some step forward but you know I'm not holding my breath because radical changes are huge can I be really cheeky Joel asked the question can you make fen from just go and look at Wick and fen please which National Trust um, when I was director general we had a a vision to expand the nature reserve by buying up adjacent agricultural land and it's worked. So go and have a look. You can do it, I suppose, is the ultimate positive answer. You can bring nature back, but you have to be determined to do so. And I hope the government will shift to be really determined by responding to the desk up to review. Super. And I'd like to suggest to everybody that you can write to your local MP if you want and, and tell them what you've heard about today and tell them to do something, perhaps. So on that positive note I'd just like to say thank you to Fiona, Richard and Charles for a fascinating I feel just a small insight into the challenge we face but uh, really really useful um, thank you very much um, so we're going to move on now so um, rather rudely I'm going to say to our panelists thank you but also goodbye you don't Bye. have to stay on for this so thank you very much and we're going to move on to our annual meeting goodbye Bye. thanks bye, bye, bye Fiona bye Charles <laughs>